Hello, this is Nice Wander of the Now Man Show, and I'm here with Mike Garson, who is a keyboardist, pianist, composer, and he is also known as a collaborator and sideman with numerous artists. In this particular episode, we're going to focus on David Bowie. Mike Garson, welcome to the Now Man Show. Nice to be here. When did you first meet David? I met David in um, 1972. I've told the story a few times where I was given a piano lesson in Brooklyn. My wife was working and the phone rings and it's David Bowie's manager. And he says, can you come down for an audition in Manhattan in 20 minutes at RCA recording studios? Here's the, I have a daughter that's one year old swinging on a little swing right next to the piano, a piano student there who I just met and I don't know who Bowie is, and they're asking me to do an audition. So it sounded interesting. So I left the piano student to babysit <laughs> my daughter. My <laughs> wife wanted to kill me, and, and she was not home. And I went, and Mick Ronson, the lead guitarist, was conducting the audition, and he put the music up of the David Bowie song called Changes, and I played, as I told many times, seven or eight seconds, and. He stopped me and he said, you have the gig? I said, I haven't even begun. He said, I can tell. I play the piano also. So they hired me for eight weeks, and I managed to last there to 2006 on and off. So that you went on tour then with the Spiders from Mars. The first American tour, we opened up in Cleveland. The, the really big album that, that, that happened uh, was the studio album. The first one was Aladdin Sane, right? That was the first one in 1973, and that was pure luck. I get a email every day from someone in the world regarding that album. So the, the, the story of Aladdin the Sane, how, how did that come together, that song? Well, I was um, in there to do an overdub, and there's a lot of this going on. There. So Bowie asked for a piano solo, and I played something like this. stops me and he says that's typical blues we don't want that so he says try something else and it goes again so I start playing things so playing Latin these kind of things and he said that's interesting <clears throat> but he said to me I heard you played on the avant-garde scene in, in Manhattan in New York in the 60s can you do something like that and my remark, of course, is, you don't want that. That's why I'm not working Saturday night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. Just do it. And it was one take. And then the band's doing this. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Except they were doing that. So I had both hands to do this. But when you hear it isolated, it doesn't sound so good. He was smart enough to know if you had a solid rhythm section playing a groove, you could play this freeness on top. So that was where his brilliance lied. Because some of that music by itself doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but he framed it in this context with a bass drum and a groove and great guitar playing, and that's how it happened. And it made perfect sense. It was one take, he loved it. A few months later, the one of the newspapers in London, I don't know if it was The Guardian or The London Times, Right on the top, it's, it was a Bowie quote, quote, and said, Mike Garson is the best rock pianist in the world because he doesn't play rock. <laughs> Typical David Bowie. And uh, I was off and running, you know, in Melody Maker, which is one of their papers over there, within a few weeks, like I'm third best pianist in the world, you know. Like, where did that come from? Nobody knew me a few weeks early. I was playing in jazz clubs with uh, three people there, making $5 a night. Wow, wow. Could you play the very beginning of time? I've always liked that that introduction you did you there. Like I used some a stride piano from the 30s mixed with some avant-garde elements, and I think I played this. <laughs> time! <laughs> <laughs> That's, it. That's fantastic. So um, after that, Bowie did a kind of a cover tune album, right, called Pinups. It was all 
English uh, songs yeah. by English composers, and there was one by Sid Barrett that was called C. Emily Play, yeah. and a, a wild piano solo on that I played, now that I remember. Mm -hmm. And I really liked also the uh, the, the Rolling Stones uh, "Let's Spend the Night Together" that you did. There. Yeah, he asked for a crazy intro on that, and I did something like that. Something like that. <laughs> See, and that's that's very entertaining as well as actually there's a lot going on there. I think you know it's very easy to, to underestimate what you are creating in that moment. That's right. There's recognition of the melody, there's counterpoint, there's uh, jazz chords, there's virtuosity. But David was very open-minded and he was a great artist, so he heard many things. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to pull that out of me and others. He's like a great producer, which a lot of people don't realize. And that's because he states his overall vibe or vision or concept and he gets out of the way and lets you do your thing because he knows he's hired you. So yeah. everyone he's hired, Carlos, Alomar, Luther, Vandross, Dave Sanborn, Michael Kamen, um, Sterling Campbell, Zach Alford, Galen Dorsey, Earl Slick, Nick Ronson, you know, everyone who's been in his band delivered something that was magical. The producer Ken Scott, Tony Visconti, uh, Niall Rogers on Next Dance. These people, every one of them were brilliant. I let them do their own thing. And, and he afforded me that same thing. So you continued on uh, working on uh, Diamond Dogs too, right? That was pretty much me and him in the studio a lot because he played all the guitars and all that. And uh, that was a very, very underrated album as far as I was concerned, but it was a great album. And, and my best playing on that, I think, is Sweet Things and The Candidate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that album, and I love the song 1984. I came up with this thing from uh, one of those 60s science fiction things, no, like yeah. Star Trek or one of those, yeah. and, and then I played harpsichord on it. He, he, um, he, he was experimenting with cutting up lyrics, and this is, I think, he got something from William Burroughs, and I think um, it was fascinating how he was creating his lyrics using this method. So it had an avant-garde touch to it. And also at that time, uh, there was a couple of live albums too, particularly the David Live. And isn't that the tour where, were you on that entire tour? And, and he transitioned from Diamond Dogs to the Young Americans. Uh, and then- It was a very expensive tour and there was lots of stuff on stage was like a Broadway show and we ran out of money so we went from the East Coast to the West Coast doing the Diamond Dogs tour. When we got to the other side in California we came back with the Young Americans band very stripped down and I had a soul band basically. I was playing with all American musicians that were white and black that understood their music. I was playing gospel things. I wasn't playing avant-garde stuff. On that Young Americans album it's, got, it's gonna be me. That song didn't get released for 10, 15 years after the album came out. Can you hear me? Young Americans, these are things that, like, he switched the whole vibe. So that was a, <clears throat> an exceptional tour. The Diamond Dogs tour was phenomenal. It's sad that it was never recorded. He, mm. since then, has pretty much recorded everything we ever did. We missed that, and that was the most expensive, expensive tour. It was just a great experience. And on Young Americans, it's you really... Uh, the piano in Young Americans, the title cut, really drove the whole band, yeah, right? Yeah, I set that little pattern up. Something like that. And I used a bit of a Latin, we call it a Montuno, and I kind of played something like that. It's not exactly what I played. But um, it gave the whole vibe and the impetus for the rest of the song. I'm sort of good at that as a musical director and as a band leader and as a composer and arranger to find little hooks and then everyone sort of finds their part from there and it's sort of it's like igniting the fire and then everyone takes it from there yeah and you and and uh, producer tony visconti and and carlos alomar probably were the three people that played with bowie more than anybody else right well, or, or worked with bowie Tony as a producer right. mm -hmm. he, he you know he knew him from the 60s and he did his last album so mm -hmm. uh but as a player uh i been in the band the longest, and then next would have been Carlos. Wow. Mm -hmm. So more than Carlos. And then would be Earl Slick. Wow, that's fantastic. It's hard to believe, because I was only hired for eight weeks, but I must have played 400 concerts with David live. 